Okay, so I think we, we might start. Um, so it's great to be here this morning. I'm Dr. Sharon Webb. I'm a senior lecturer in digital humanities in the University of Sussex in the UK. I'm also a co-director of the Sussex Digital Humanities Lab. Um, and I am here with my colleagues um, who are part of the Full Stack Feminism team. We are a team consisting of um, uh, computer scientists, historians, digital arts practitioners, um, media um, uh, experts and curators. Um, and so this panel consists of, as I said, members of Full Stack Feminism. Um, here are our Twitter handles. We're also on Mastodon um, and various other things. Um, so the structure of the panel will be... Um, a six minute, uh, sorry, six presentations of 10 minutes, um, including my own. So then we'll have a panel discussion. So if you have any questions that you want to ask any of the panelists, please keep them to the end and we'll, we'll do a Q and A at the end. We'll make sure there's plenty of room. So make sure you keep you know, note of your, your questions. So I'm gonna launch straight into my presentation. Um, which is about full stack um, histories and foundations. And I would like to do three things in 10 minutes. I would like to provide an introduction to full stack feminism in digital humanities and the panel. I wanna give historical foundations and histories to the conceptual framework. I wanna speak through one of the stacks, data and archives. So um, Full Stack Feminism is a jointly funded project from the Arts Humanities Research Council in the UK and the Irish Research Council in Ireland. And it's part of their strategic efforts to look at uh, broader um, collaborations within DH across the UK and Ireland. Um, so it's a really important kind of collaboration, which I think um, there's been lots of brilliant projects that have come up through that strategic fund. Um, we are a, a mixture of people from the University of Sussex, from Maynooth University, from TUI Dublin, as well as strategic partners like the Digital Repository of Ireland and the Irish Museum of Modern Archives. And so intersectional, um, sorry, full stack feminism then is, is centered on the belief that intersectional feminist thinking, values and practice can help us design, make, code, produce for difference. And this is from Tara McPherson's 2018 paper. It incorporates intersectional feminist praxis as a means to critique, to intervene, and to act. And full stack feminism, in many ways, is a response to our failings in the digital spaces, infrastructures, codes, worlds we inhabit, which result in harm, bias, and injustice felt and experienced in the real. So as a framework of working and questioning, it provides methods, processes, approaches, and provocations designed to help us develop more inclusive and more socially aware technologies and systems, and particularly in this context for us to think about how we can make digital humanities projects and practices more inclusive, socially aware, and um, environmentally aware as well. And it does this in a number of ways. So um, these ways will be discussed throughout the panel, um, but one particular element that I wanted to highlight is our toolkit, which we have published in a beta version for which we are actively looking for contributions. So please talk to us after the session if you'd like to contribute to any of that. It's, a, it's an open platform and we're looking for um, peer reviewers as well as people to contribute to the, to the toolkit. So the link to the toolkit is there. Um, we will have other links to it later on as well. So it's the beta version, so you know we're getting there. Um, dude, okay, so I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, yeah. So full stack feminism is part of a growing awareness of the need for responsible computing, responsible tech, which is both socially and environmentally engaged. In essence, the project, the method, the concepts asks how intersectional feminism can shape technology now and in the future. It's based on the reality that bias, whether gendered, racialized, or otherwise construed, is embedded in, the as in aspects of digital culture, from the data that is collected and stored to the tools and technologies that are used to create and manage it. That is throughout the layers of, and stacks of our technologies, and indeed in our societies. So we see full stack as a metaphor, both for technologies, as well as the kind of socio-cultural economic conditions in which these things emerge. Um, it is for this reason that we use the full stack metaphor. And behind me there, you, you can see the kind of three stacks that we engage in. Um, data and archives, infrastructures, tools and code, access, integration and experience. The vastness, though, of the task stems, of course, from the vastness of the problem of data, technological, algorithmic, and machine learning bias. And for us, this means we approach this from several points of methodological, theoretical perspectives reflected in the panel contributions today. 
So for example, Cecile explores the critical method of feminist listening, while Janine discusses the potential of digital art as an act um, to act as a feminist interface. While Irene's paper considers black trans digital art and critical confabulation, which segues into Izzy's paper on decentering dominant voices through community engagement. And this is then followed by Lawrence's talk, um, which is about curation as an act of care. So these topics reflect the values and methodological approach of full stack feminism, which includes the need to decenter expertise and critically to center a feminist ethics of care in our work, in our practices, in our thinking. It is a care for community. It is a care for collaboration and it's a care for users. The project and the concepts grows from and is influenced by movements within and across cyberfeminism, techno-feminism, eco-feminism, glitch feminism, data feminism, feminist digital humanities, queer digital humanities, among others, and reflects a societal awareness of coded bias in our digital technologies. But of course, full stack is a term borrowed um, from the field of computer science and software engineering and refers to someone who can develop both from the back end to the front end. As a metaphor, it enables us to interrogate these architectural layers from a holistical position, noting how each corresponds, influences, and indeed is influenced by each other. Full stack feminism responds to a variety of historical, societal, and cultural moments, problems and potentials and belongs to a growing field of research and work in the field of intersectional feminist, queer um, feminism and technology. And while there are many people we could highlight in this respect, I wanted to highlight work of members of the uh, digital humanities community specifically. So publications such as Bodies of Information, Intersectional Feminism and Digital Humanities highlight issues that many across the field of digital humanities recognise and grapple with. How to make digital technologies and systems more inclusive and how to consider the pluralities and collective narratives um, contained therein. And while DH may be seen as, a, and as inherently more inclusive in terms of gender balance when compared to fields like computer science or software engineering, there remains a significant lack of diversity. And all too often, feminist digital humanities and indeed queer uh, digital humanities has been sidelined and pushed to the margins. And I might say that might be the past because actually being in this room today with so many you know, people in the room um, demonstrates that this conversation is moving from the margins to the center. So it's a real testament and I think it's a point to celebrate. In addition then, the canons that underpin much of digital humanities often replicate old systems of knowledge and therefore reinforce existing patriarchal power systems. As Rapika Risham states um, in Beyond the Margins, those of us who work with issues of difference often perceive the ways that many digital humanities projects fail to engage with race, gender, disability, class, sexuality, or a combination thereof. Some of the most developed digital humanities work preserve the writing of dead white men, and I would put their cis as well. So these publications reflect ongoing calls within digital humanities diversity. And indeed, of particular note is Alan Liu's 2020 paper towards a diversity stack. And they track the history of diversity calls within uh, digital humanities. Um, and importantly, they call for a diversity stack that is operationalized, something that is reflected in our work. Um, for Lou, Annan talks about diversity in, in DH, which means the inclusion of different cultures, identities, and people. And I think specifically as well as related to full stack, it also calls for an ideal of inclusive methodology, so something which our toolkit um, looks to kind of um, develop. Um, I'm just noting my time as chair and timekeeper. I'm okay. <laughs> um, but specifically then thinking about how we operationalize this stack. So we have three stacks, data and archives, um, uh, infrastructure tools and code, access, experience, and integration. And so I just want to take some time to think about data and archives because as Klein et al states, what gets counted counts. So while we acknowledge that the stacks are iterative and non-linear, we know that data archives are the foundations of knowledge. Yet we state this from a position of intersectional queer feminism. That is, we understand and work through the history of exclusion from current knowledge regimes now embedded across our digital knowledge infrastructures. We know there's a connection between the data that is prioritized for collection, for archiving, for dissemination, and the histories and narratives and heritage that is therefore instilled upon our communities um, and our, indeed our own individual identities. It is in this sense that we take inspiration from bell hooks, 
1984 publication from margin to centre by aspiring to include community voice as a location of expert knowledge. In this respect, we engage with community heritage and archives groups such as Queer Heritage South as well as Brighton and Hove Black History Group. And we do these through a number of ways. One in particular is through our community forums, uh, which are you know, a kind of very informal conversation with members of, of different um, community heritage groups. Uh, we've had one in the UK at Sussex, and we've had one in Ireland as well. And this is just some of the highlights, I suppose, from those, stemming from those conversations. So when we say that we work with community archives and community heritage, we mean that in a caring way. So we employ an ethics of care, and we really think about the intent of that collaboration. Because all too often, and this was reflected in the community forums, these collaborations are seen as institutional exploitations for the people that are coming into that domain. They see often there's institutional judgment on respectability. This is often the case for queer data sets, which might have specific language or might uh, talk about specific bodily autonomy. And it's seen as something that has to maybe be kind of like censored in a way. There's other issues around agency, autonomy, empowerment that creates um, precariousness. And the last thing I want to say on this slide is about identity as data. Off too often, you know, there has been um, policies around diversity policies, but actually these just become fodder for specific things. And in relation to particular um, organisations, they have become fodder, or they would be fodder for machine learning algorithms when you know tech companies are looking for more diverse data sets. Another thing to highlight as well is, is the way that we are engaging with communities is through our um, surveys. Um, and this is um, for, you know, for people to engage with as well. Um, so we've asked a number of questions, you know, one in particular, have you encountered bias in technology? 25% of people said they were unsure. So this is what Tanya Butcher talks about in terms of the unknown knowns or the known unknowns. Another person said there's too many examples, and another said communities around technologies can exclude women. So these are the types of things that we are trying to um, uh, consider and intervene in when we are looking at full stack feminism. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Chevalier, uh, Cecile Chevalier, who's a senior lecturer in digital arts practice at the University of Sussex. Thank you, Sharon. Hello everyone, uh, I don't know if I'm, maybe my cup the right way. Can you hear me? Yes, I think. <laughs> okay, so uh, thinking of stack two um, as, um, we're gonna start, or I'm going to start a fem feminist, sorry, maybe I need to, here we go. So feminist listening is an approach to counter, um, to counter othering in full stack technology and society at large. It recognized the need to return to a human fochi to sustain marginalized community heritage. It recognizes the plurality of individual voices in collective, from resonance to tension, share struggles and hopes. Um, and feminist listening is not a claim to new terrains or a field of knowledge, but it is instead a call, an act from a place and other places for collective listening, firmly located in feminist ethics of care, computational infrastructure, tools, and code. So um, what we mean in terms of politically engaged community or marginalized communities, so in preserving queer voices, Sharon Webb here on the stage, <laughs> discuss politically engaged communities, grassroots and DIY archive as a unique and crucial contribution to historical narratives and challenge agenomenics, heteronormative and patriarchal notions of heritage. Politically engaged communities archive are also like a lived space from which collective memory transform towards cultural memory um, and towards social change a space for social practice, artifact, histories, and at its core, politics of voice and forms of ethics of care. So what does it mean when such communities are situated within corporate tech imaginaries? Um, yeah. Sorry. Ah. Okay. So imaginaries that frame mining, scrapping, extra extractivism, practice of human and natural resource, and the democracy 
and take for good. Practice that not only reproduce inherited cultural bias, microaggressions, aggressions, at an, impossible, at an impossible speed of scale, but also how knowledge is distributed and by who and for who. Kate Crawford and Vladen Jolla in the anatomy of AI system points to full stack riches beyond the multi-layered tech, technical stack of data modeling, hardware, servers, and network into capital labor and nature. In this infrastructure, full stack feminism mean to insert, insert form of ethics of care. So Crawford and Jola in 2018 anatomy um, of an AI system is a full stack mapping of the Amazon Echo Alexa, a machine listening device that contains seven directional microphones, audio signaling processing, and machine learning to make a sense of sound and speech. The user can be listened to, listen, at all time, and listening is also framed to support visual impaired users. Um, is that happening? So positioning the reader of such a system at the intersection between human, nature, and technology, and framing the user as quoting simultaneously a consumer, a uh, maybe not yet, I don't know why it's turning. <laughs> Can we go back? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, sorry. So yeah, and framing the user um, as a consumer, a resource, a worker, and a product, one can see can see how full stack become reflective of democratic societies at large, where the user is also a citizen. However, full stack are claim terms with a stated by Crawford and Jolla, constant tracking, quantified, commodified. I would add where boundaries between personal and public are opaque, where commodification leads to surveillance, and therefore asking in such a system, what does it mean to belong as a citizen or non-citizen? When marginalized access to level of technological autonomy and creativity becomes central to hacking and digging deep new to sorry digging deep new shared digital pathways, a slow and laborious process takes place, often built from lived experience, situated often finding roots in punks repair culture, to it um, to do it together and craft and activism, drawing from. Um, Yuval Davis, um, Politics of Belonging, where care is discussed as an alternative, alternative metaphysics, I quote, identities and belongings need to be constructed primarily not as an autom autonomous rational attitude, but as a relational and di dialogical. How can this take place in full stack um, systems? Corporate imaginaries, whether AI system, quantum system, in its race for supremacy, speed up, scaling up, making it harder for individuals and communities to keep up with access to tech, towards tech alternative imaginaries and belongings. And hopefully. Yeah, I don't know. I click, but again? <laughs> I don't want to keep clicking. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> uh, feminist server as such, as such alternative. So there are spaces. It does exist. Um, for example, back in 2005, and still current, sister servers, uh, which was originally launched by Gender Changes in 2000, are feminist server and places of relationality between voices, archive and collections, ethics of care and technological alternative that reflect access, a social flesh between pluralism and plurality as marginalized, marginalized voices get marginalized and are, um, and are or their different histories accumulate towards collective listening, reflecting the collective voice during trans hack feminism questions such as what would be the purpose and principles of feminist server? Can feminist server support women feminists in uh, um, GLBTQI in their uh, fight for having their rights for such a freedom of expression? And opinion respected. 
Can we create trust among us to develop cooperative approach to the management of those space and resistance and transformation? Yep. So collect collective listening uh, with marginalized community archive and feminist server is first a call for recognition, a call for the community, for the singular, singular voices that lead the individual change, solidarity and collective strength, shifting uh, who and what can be seen. It is also a call for social change and marginalized heritage. For exa example, um, as yet an has yet to enter a public listening. Quoting Cavarero um, in um, For More Than One Voice, without such commodification, without action in a shared space of reciprocal exhibition, uniqueness remain a mere ontological given, the given of an ontology that is not able to make itself political. In this discussion, collective listening is also a frame is also framed in relation to full-stack corporate imaginary, creating complex paradigms. Then why feminist listening? Uh, hopefully it's the next slide. Lucia and Fifth uh, frames listening as a conscious act, an active, uh, while Bath, uh, Bathes, uh, Caudry and Bassel discuss it as a process to recognize and register the uniqueness of others' narratives. I would state that to listen of your own accord is willing to be transformed. Differentiating from the echo machine listening, uh, listening system as an ear in your home, uh, whilst listening with, within feminist server becomes a relational process as network between individual paths, collective organism converging in the creation of social space towards a political space. In, in relating narrative, Adriana Cavero discussed listening not as a single act, but a part of a mechanism of storytelling and story taking, and vulnerability and violence. While Husserl, uh, I might pronounce with my French accent, so excuse me, uh, and Wolford frames vulnerability towards an ethics of care um, and of non-violence, uh, quoting instead, the intersectionary humanism of their account of vulnerability reveal the imbrication of the ethical, the ontological, and the political. Taking, taking stories and vulnerability as yet to be reflected in the use uh, of machine learning, where the act of listening is a, med is a mediation, an inequality with capitalist aim, consumerism lens, and individual desire as opposed to needs. In taking individual lives experience, or sorry, lived experience, the perform equality as an endless monologue stripped of its labor, stripped of its heritage. Um, that said, and quoting uh, again Fari, uh, Farinati and Firth, um, as they think of listening as a method of techniques of social change, a practice for creating potential um, political space, changing decision-making process and organizational process, and therefore transforming power relation in a very direct and concrete way. And here is our, ho our DH hope. Um, thank you. Next, uh, Janine Nadji, Associate Professor of Digital Media in Maynooth University in Ireland, will talk to us. Good morning, everybody. Just checking that works. Okay, can you still hear me through the microphone? Is that okay? Okay. Um, okay, everybody. So I'm Janine Naji, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit um, about digital art as a feminist interface. So to recap, these are the three stacks of our project. And my talk um, focuses this paper is concerned with the third stack in the full stack feminist framework, which deals with access, experience, and integration. Stack three can be considered the front end, 
and relates to the ways in which digital tools, resources, and archives are accessed and experienced by users, consumers, by archivists, and ways in which knowledge and digital cultural heritage is accessible or indeed inaccessible. In all cases, accessibility in digital archives is mediated through the interface. Interfaces matter and are an important entry point into digital humanities for the public. For example, Ruberg et al. note that as feminist scholars, they recognize that computational tools are not apolitical. They have an impact, they structure meaning, and visualizations craft interpretation. As such, an interface can be seen in a space in which meaningful embodied interaction takes place in a networked environment. Or an interface can be seen as a component of a digital work, in which case it operates more like an index to specific content. As such, this paper discusses feminist human computer interaction, or HCI, as a design methodology that seeks to incorporate feminist values such as inclusion, diversity, and social justice in the development of interactive media. Furthermore, the full stacks, uh, stack three, therefore, proposes that as per McPherson, the use of feminist HCI methodologies can make the case for digital art texts to operate as archival interfaces in order to maximize public understanding in digital humanities and create a milieu for intersectional cultural heritage. Stack three of the project is mostly concerned with the design of the full stack feminist toolkit, which will be a web-based collection that can be uh, applied by digital humanities communities and organizations to help create more inclusive and representative digital tools, archives, and projects. It is a digital drawing together of the many components of the project and a core resource and method that I am applying to its design draws from Shawan Bardzell's seminal 2010 Feminist Human Computer Interaction paper. Here is the current draft of our sitemap for our toolkit. As you can see, it has many different entry points and platforms, which makes it a challenging project to design a coherent interface design for. However, the challenging aspect of its platform pluralism is also its strength, as the hope is that it is providing a plurality of entry points to the content. One part I wish to highlight is the objects and stories, where we will situate the digital artist's work which is being developed at the moment by our two artists in residence, Roby Orua and Jamila Prouse. I will discuss later on in this paper how digital artworks can act as a feminist interface to meaningful digital embodiment. For now, let me return to Bardzell's methodology. Despite such a strong framework being proposed by Bardzell in 2010, there is still a paucity of understanding regarding its implication within real world practice and established heteronormative digital systems. There exist some examples of web-based projects that use Bardzell's feminist HCI framework, such as Archive of Our Own, a fan fiction archive made by the community for the community. Case Lee Feastler, Shannon Morrison, and Amy S. Brookman presented a talk on this entitled, An Archive of Their Own, a Case Study of Feminist HCI and Values in Design at the 2016 Conference on Human Factors in Computing Systems. In it, they describe the processes involved in the creation of a bottom-up designed fan fiction archive that emerged out of a failed top-down attempt to monetize a fan fiction community's output, which created an extreme disconnect with that community's value system. User interface design is a practical field that works towards a nexus of praxis in a utopian ideal of an imagined user. 
However, as Bardzell points out sometimes in evoking a user, the human can get lost. Who among us consider ourselves ideal? I think of Laura Forlano's 2016 paper, Hacking the Feminist Disabled Body Here. Forlano's paper talks of the embodied cyborg experience of being a type 1 diabetic and relying on competing proprietary systems. Forlano critiques masculinist approaches to hacking and instead seeks a feminist ethics of engagement, which is less solution focused and instead pays more attention to the embodied experiences and practices engaging with socio-technical systems, taking particular note of invisible labor and structural inequalities. How can we transfer a qualitative, embodied interactive interaction experience as evoked by Forlano into an interface design approach? As my research into the field of intersectional digital humanities deepens, it occurs to me that a feminist HCI approach results in better and more rigorously designed digital systems and so should be implemented in all digital design processes. However, it must be noted that it is not an approach that situates speed and profit at its core. To return to Bardzell and the qualities of feminist interaction for feminist HCI design, these are listed as pluralism, participation, advocacy, ecology, embodiment, and self-disclosure. For the purposes of today's paper, I'm going to focus on embodiment. HCI research, such as Durish's in 2001, considers the philosophical concept of embodiment and attempts to remember our bodies and selves in the human-computer interaction process. Embodied HCI can be a way of remembering the human part of the human-computer interaction, which had perhaps skewed a little bit too, mu too much towards the computer side of things and a normative Western ideal of a user. Contemporary turns consider human subjectivities, and Bardzell argues that more attention needs to be paid to the different ways that gender can impact different experiences of embodiment in our interactions with the machine. Situating embodiment within, po within post-human theories, such as those from Haraway, Hales, and Hales, can help us break down binary concepts, which can also connect us to the HC feminist HCI value of plurality. Human subjectivities and embodiment are very much considered by the Full Stack Feminist Toolkit and will continue to be throughout all aspects of the, the development process. The digital artworks will be key here, and the research I am presenting today builds on a 2022 paper that I co-wrote with Michael Rozeski entitled Digital Poetry as a Dublin City Data Interface. In it, I propose the use of a digital poem called The River Poem that I made as a literary interface to Dublin City data. In all digital texts, the interface mediates the experience for the user. Interfaces matter and are an important part of the meaning-making process for the user. So therefore, viewing the river poem as an interface to data city can, in this case, offer a path for future development of digital interfaces that incorporate humanistic elements in an embodied and meaningful manner to the benefit of their audiences. Drucker refers to literary interfaces as interfaces for digital literature or electronic literature works. However, my 2022 paper modifies this approach slightly to offer a work of digital literature as an interface to open city data. Drucker tells us that an interface can be narrowly defined in terms of on-screen features that unfold a text, but more broadly defined as to include the user's embodied experience and relationships with not only the technologies, text, and networks they're engaging with, 
but also, more broadly, the cultural conditions in which these interactions take place. Thinking about embodied experiences in the digital space in this manner can allow us to consider and take into account more broadly the entirety of the user's experience in a networked environment as opposed to restrictively only considering a singular artifact. The human computer interaction term, embodied interaction, builds on Hutchby's concepts of technological affordances from his 2001 paper, Technologies, Texts and Affordances. It is also a useful term to use in the analysis of human meaning making in order to recognize the contextual, fluid and collaborative nature of meaning making in the digital realm. Embodied interaction is discussed by Paul Durish as an approach from the field of human computer and interaction that is based on the understanding that users create and communicate meaning through their interaction with the system and with each other through the system. So in suggesting that the river poem operates as a literary interface to open city data, this can allow alternative entry points to members of the public or citizens who may not have specific data science skills or be experienced with archival methods, for example. Digital poetry and digital art can offer interactivity, non-linearity, and multiple entry points for users, and can offer new spaces for perceiving and interacting with stories in spaces that would otherwise be out of reach. Furthermore, research on health data communication, for example, has concluded that high interactivity in data visualization showed significant indirect effects on participants' attitudes towards policy change only when presented with the highly interactive narrative. Similarly, Rostrami, Rosito, and Wern, when discussing mixed reality performances that used virtual reality and 360 degree video, concluded that allowing users to take a more active role in digital texts is what can make digital stories engaging and coherent, rather than the completely immersive nature of technologies. Culturally driven, creative, multimodal content can potentially move static data visualizations beyond literal visual representations of data and incorporate various dimensions of imagination and interaction that can embody the unique characteristics of a place or an artifact. Um, con contributions and connections are welcome to our project, so I've listed our PubHub there as well as our project site, and there's the QR code for our survey. Now I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, Irene Fubara Manuel, a lecturer in digital media practice in S University of Sussex. I have to fumble with the mic a little bit more. Okay, can everybody hear me? Perfect. Um, so, you'll have to listen to me and watch videos at the same time. Um, so my paper will be connecting Stacks 1, Digital Archives, and Stacks 2, Code and Infrastructure. I will flesh out black feminists and queer theories of fabrication. I will expand on creative practices that implement the methods that I call critical confabulation. Here, digital art doesn't only act as an interface, as Janine has said, but it's also reproductive, it creates, it builds new frameworks of digital culture, new architectures and infrastructure through a confabulation of the past and the present. Before expanding on the term confabulation uh, and looking at the works of two black queer artists, Rashad Newsom and Daniel Braithwaite Shirley, um, who is also a collaborator and a person connected to our network as well, I want to call back to a key moment in the diasporic black trans archive. I just want to go back a bit. Can I go back? And, because I feel like I would like this to keep playing. 
In an analysis of black queer performance, Tavian Yogo reintroduces readers to an iconic act of black drag queen, Crystal Abeja, from the 1968 documentary, The Queen. Declared the third runner up to a younger white winner, in the 1967 Miss All America Camp Beauty Pageant, La Beja walks off the stage. She does not respond to what she reads as unfair and tasteless, biased against black femme beauty with the grace expected of a runner up. Instead, as Nyongo says, she performs for and against the camera. As she dissents this decision, she calls everyone out from the judges to the documentary filmmakers for being complicit in a system that exploits and undervalues black femmes. She revolts against the camera, claiming she never signed a release form while also asking the camera to, rec to record her, document her beauty in contestation uh, with the other con um, contestant. In her defiance, La Beja breaks out of the archive as created as a documentary filmmakers. As Nyogo notes, she speaks to us here in the future. This scene is particularly poignant as La Beja later on becomes one of the founders of ballroom culture, influencing mainstream pop culture from Madonna's Vogue to television series po Pose. The form of archival analysis Nyogo conducts in this reintroduction La Beja is one the scholar calls Afrofabulation. Nyogo builds on the critical, builds on the theory of critical fabulation from the black feminist scholar Hartman. Afrofabulation is a theory of black time and temporality that searches for the people who are missing in the archives. It focuses on archives of black performance and art. On the other hand, critical fabulation is a practice of speculative renarration that moves beyond the li limits of the archive. In Hartman's case, the archive she's wrestling with is the violent uh, archive of transatlantic trans slavery where the only reliable accounts of the lives of enslaved black women are those of their slave masters. So as Hartman knows, to tell the story of an enslaved woman from the perspective of her captors is to repeat a violence. Therefore, to critically fabulate is to tell a story with and against an archive. It is to contest the fictions of history with fables from the meantime, from here and now. The fabulation in Afrofabulation is not only to retell fables, but from a queer of color theoretical framing, fabulation is connected to fabulousness. In the song Jewelry um, by Blood Orange, black trans art icon Janet Mock addresses the phrase used to denigrate black queer people, they're doing too much. Mock retorts to this asking, why would we want to do the list? As queer scholars Madison Moore notes, the desire to do the most comes from a defiance of oppressive system that threatens black transness, queerness with violence. As more rights, fabulousness is glitter as defiance, political, political glitter, a glitter bomb through everyday life. Under the queer of color framing, to fabulate is to throw this political glitter bomb in the archive. It is to document black queer life in all its richness, in all its fabulousness that evades traditional forms of archiving. To paraphrase Daniel Breithwaite Shirley, it is to hold the ways in which black trans people at this time in this location tell their stories. On this note, I would like to turn to critical fabulation of archives in the digital art of Rashad Newsom and Daniel Breithwaite Shirley. Don Newsom is a multidisciplinary artist from America, and Daniel Bruce Shirley is an artist from London. Their, work, their works are connected to a genealogy that can be traced back to the fabulous, defiant performance of Krista Labeja. The future, sorry, instead of speaking from the past, they speak from the meantime to show alternative visions of the future. Both black and queer, Newsom and Brithwood Shirley use digital arts to archive trans life. In this, in this collective, it is this collective and diasporic fabulation that I call confabulation. In their retelling and recitations of stories via digital media, Newsom and Breakthrough Shirley confabulate new subjecthoods, new architectures that center marginalized communities. In Rashad Newsom's work, Build or Destroy, a ballroom dancer is adorned with gold diamond jewelry. That's the one that the video that you have seen perhaps earlier. This figure adorned in gold diamond jewelry, black latex, and fish stockings. The fabulous figure performs in front 
of a backdrop of buildings and sets cars ablaze that sets rather. The fabulous figure performs in front of a backdrop of building and cars that, set, that are set ablaze. The top half of the figure's body is also on fire. Their face is transparent in a manner that resembles a common video game glitch. The problem that Newsom is pointing towards here is not purely computational, but an issue of gender. Using 3D simulations and modeling, build or destroy examines the construction of gender provoking viewers to consider what might remain in debris. What might we produce if we set gender on fire? In addition to an archiving of black trans fabulousness via 3D modeling, Newsom also archives their embodied performance through motion capture. Confabulation takes on a collaboratory form as the performances are actual movements from artists. Daniel Brithwood Shirley's work, She Keeps Me Damn Alive, also incorporates this mode of archiving the embodied movements of queer people. Braithwaite Shirley uses photographs of other black trans people in their community to add a touch of reality to their digital worlds. This mode of archiving is also visible in their earlier works such as Black Trans Archive, where the hair and images of black trans people are textures in the world. She Keeps Me Damn Alive, on the other hand, is a video game using the blocky retro aesthetics of games such as 1996 Tomb Raider. Instead of exploring cavernous tombs in search of treasure, the player in this first-person shooter game wields a 3D printed gun as a controller. As they move through a world that challenges them with the provocation of protecting black trans people. In the Art Bite um, exhibition material, Birthway Shirley writes, this gun gives you the power to act. I hope you reconsider what you shoot, when you shoot, and how comfortable you are pulling the trigger. The treaty gun called the actuator opens another form of confabulation. This is fabrication. I've written about it in a different, or I've spoken about it in a different conference. Ask me about, me, ask me about it later. But the treaty gun called the actuator opens up another form of confabulation. The collective design and production of technology that one might encounter at a fab lab or a digital fabrication lab. The fabricated gun asks players to consider who is worth protecting. Moving beyond gaming, it throws a glitter bomb in our political world. As the player holds onto the controller, they have to wrestle with how they choose or do not choose to protect black trans people in their everyday life. This game, as with Newsom's artworks, demonstrates the function of digital art to burn old worlds and fabricate new ones. Through the collective documenting and archiving of black trans life, these works confabulate and activate fabulous digital infrastructures and architectures. So that's me. I'm done. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening. I shall now pass on to my colleague. <laughs> Thank you. I shall now pass on to my colleague, Izzy Fox, pronounce she, her. Uh, she is the postdoctoral researcher with Full Stack Feminism in Maynooth University in Ireland. Thanks very much, Ari, for that great talk. Um, how's everyone doing? Still okay? <laughs> And so we're nearly there with our talks. Um, so thanks for, for staying with us to this point. And I'm delighted to be here and looking forward to hearing all of the rest of the great panels and workshops and, um, and talks. Um, OK, I'm going to time myself because brevity is not my strong point. So as my colleagues will attest to. Um, okay, so my talk is entitled Community Engagement Interviews, Digital, Digitally Mediated Storytelling as, as Knowledge. Can everyone hear me okay? I was just conscious that I was standing away from the mic there. Um, okay. And so I've conducted the community engagement interviews as, as part of our research project. And the, the purpose of the interviews is to identify the problem domain, which has been... Um, I think very well articulated by my other team members. Um, and it's also about 
I suppose, breaking down those barriers between communities and the institution of, of academia. Um, so in that sense, it's about decentering knowledge and voices and practices. Um, and it's also um, part of feeding into our toolkit. So we're getting recommendations through those interviews about what to put into our, our toolkit. Um, so for the purpose then of today's talk, I'm just I'm going to focus on community engagement and then um, the ways in which the interviewees through their praxis, through their research, serve to um, decentral knowledge and voices and technologies and practices in, in various ways. Okay, so community archives, feminist digital art, creative coding practices, um, game design, as well as DH projects that employ an intersectional feminist framework and, and an ethics of care to their work provide a provocation and a critical intervention to the culture of exclusion, erasure and bias. In other words, the problem domain um, that my fellow team members have identified. Through various community engagement methods, uh, which are in particular um, discussed, we are collaborating with representatives from communities of digital artists, community digital archivists, game designers, software developers, activists, scholars, and, and more, um, who have traditionally been marginalized within DH in order to identify the biases, exclusions, and limitations, but also the transformative potential of the digital tools, platforms, infrastructure, um, and methodologies these practitioners employ. Um, and for the purposes then of my talk, I'll focus, as I said, on the interviews in particular. And our commitment to decentering knowledge and voices is, is very much connected to our method of community engagement, including the interviews, as we ask, what counts as knowledge in DH and who gets to produce it? So in a moment, I'll highlight some of the critical and creative interventions that our interviewees have employed to actively decenter dominant knowledge systems, perspectives and technologies, including prioritizing storytelling and embodiment through their research and praxis. So archiving oral histories, documenting da dance practice, utilizing virtual reality as a space to disrupt the gender binary through playfulness, and animating archival artifacts exemplify some of the innovative ways in which our interviewees disrupt and reimagine what counts as knowledge and who gets to produce it by foregrounding marginalized lives, experiences, bodies, and practices. For example, a couple of our interviewees refer to how dance and movement can be codified and archived. One of these interviewees, who is a dancer, choreographer, and scholar, acknowledges that a reason why dance, unlike music, is marginalized within scholarship is because it is feminized. And they argue for the body and emotion to be recognized as a legitimate site of knowledge production. For example, their work uses wearable technology to document dance practice um, and to interface with the body through performance. For them, their art is research and their research is art. So in this paradigm, research, archi archival creation, and art are co-constitutive, rather than one form or method being subservient or dominant to the other. So just to be aware, I'm going to refer to some of the interviewees by name, and some of the interviewees will be anonymous. Some of them have chosen to be anonymous. We're still in the midst of the interview process. I've interviewed 19 people so far, and we're still kind of um, finalizing the transcripts and, and all, all of that. So that's why some of them are anonymized and some of them are identified. Um, so T. Braun, a uh, digital ar artist and creator whom I interviewed, embraces social VR, along with other queer, trans, and non-binary people, um, to what, what they say, to explore new forms of queer embodiment. Uh, this experimental practice can be empowering and identity forming for those with gender dysphoria, for instance. However, while avatars can be constructed from various body parts in creative forms of self-expression, Braun identifies that the bank of body parts um, available to construct an avatar 
are still predominantly white, able-bodied, and gender normative. So this still, it's a, still problematic there. Another curator and academic I interviewed through their digital practice and research of, of um, cultural objects from a country in East Africa identifies the role that 3D technology can play in animating museum and archival artifacts, as well as challenging the provenance of certain objects, often attributed to, and I'm going to do my air quotes here, the experts who documented the songs or collected the objects. Furthermore, this practitioner was able to superimpose the work songs related to particular objects, returning context, meaning, and narrative to both the artifacts and the songs, you know, that had been severed from each other through violent colonial practices of m museum collection, pillaging, in other words, um, description and curation. Uh, finally, Jamie A. Lee, a DH scholar and, and archivist, articulating what the majority of her interviewees acknowledge, states that in their interview, um, that storytelling allows for a deeper connection and to show that we're not all the same. In other words, storytelling embraces difference, nuance, and messiness. A storytelling is an embodied practice insofar as it is, as Trine states, seen, heard, smelled, tasted, and touched. Furthermore, Lee explores the embodied responses of joy and desire in the archive, i.e., which objects and stories, etc., pique our interest and why. They also recognize the role that the digital can play in augmenting and animating archival data and contributing to these positive emotions, while obviously also being cognizant of the prevalence of trauma in the archive as well. Their work also highlights the hybridic or co-constitutive nature of the digital and the material, the archive and the body. And uh, Jamie Lee also even speaks of the archive itself as a body. Um, okay, and so why, I mean, I've identified some of the examples, but, but why in particular are storytelling embodiment important modes of knowledge production in DH? So as Donna Haraway states, it matters what stories make worlds, what worlds make stories. As my fellow team members have identified and as I've illustrated through the examples I've given from our community engagement interviews, the narratives that permeate mainstream archives, museums, art galleries, scholarship and technologies are often incomplete or even biased against minoritized communities. Conversely, the importance placed on digitally medi mediated and embodied modes of storytelling not only challenge, disrupt, and reimagine the historical record, but also enable intersectional feminist futures to be imagined based on creativity, playfulness, and diversity. Um, as we now know from, from, our, from Irene, uh, Sadia Hartman articulated your concept or the concept of critical fabulation to account for the erasure of enslaved black women and girls in the archive. In turn, Haraway's term speculative fabulation extends this to um, historical records pertaining to other marginalized and minoritized groups. Finally, MAP applies, LAP, sorry, not MAP, LAP applies providential fabulation to archival creation, disrupting notions of singular creations or objective truth. For instance, she gives the example of a, of a smudge on a photograph. Um, as an example of how provenance can be contested and limited, so the smudge of a fingerprint, um, as well as the role of embodiment, literally the finger, um, in knowledge production. The creative, critical and fabulatory interventions by our interviewees and by our project as a whole challenge the binary between fact and fiction, owner and contributor, memory and evidence, data and technologies, are, as well as theory and praxis. Okay. Um, so as... Taguchi points out um, an understanding of the co-constitutive nature of these factors that I've just discussed, points to the usefulness of diffractive analysis in the research pro process. Diffraction derives from the Latin verb um, de frangere, I'm probably saying that wrong. Um, it's easier when you're writing this, <laughs> you forget they have to actually read it out. Um, literally meaning to break apart. So in the original experiment in quantum physics, a single light source, when it passes through two slits in a metal sheet, as you can see in this diagram, splits in two, resulting in waves that overlap and interfere, um, producing a seemingly binary pattern of light and darkness on the screen to the, to the right of the image. However, the darkness is a consequence of light being placed on top of light, challenging our understanding of sameness and difference, including between digital and material realms. Feminist readings of diffraction can be attributed to both Donna Haraway and Karen Barad, among others, as a way to challenge binary thinking, and has been applied to the analysis of research data by Taguchi and others. 
Um, the following explanation of diffractive research analysis comes from my article on, on PubHub, which you can um, access if you're interested. Uh, when the, the two-slit diffraction experiment is invoked as a metaphor for the research project, the light symbolizes the research data, um, so coming in towards those two slits, while the slits um, depict the research methods, theories, and pra practices. The slits therefore illustrate the research questions posed, the theories adopted, uh, the apparatus used, the positionality of the researcher, as well as the ethical framework applied. Furthermore, the pattern reflected on the screen elucidates the effects or outcomes of all of these factors involved in the research process. Consequently, if the number or position of the slits is changed, so too is the interference pattern, as well as the pattern that appears on the screen um, at, towards the end, namely the research findings. Um, so basically, yeah, so the methods, if they're changed, if the theories are changed, if the apparatus is changed, so too are the outcomes and the findings. So it's important, however, to ask, in what way does a diffractive methodology differ from a feminist one? Um, so firstly, our project is not abandoning a feminist research approach, a feminist approach to research. Instead, alluding to Barad, we're placing intersectional feminism in, co in conversation with diffraction. In addition, there are many synergies between these methodologies and frameworks, such as acknowledging the embodied and embedded nature of the researcher in the research process, in contrast to the view from nowhere approach, the objective seer, which, as Lapp argues, perpetuates and sustains heteropatriarchal, classed, and race hierarchies of power. Moreover, a diffractive methodology, as articulated by Haraway, for instance, draws from feminist critical approaches and moves beyond reflection as a methodology, such as Haraway's own situated knowledges. Okay, this is my last slide. Um, diffractive analysis recognizes the entanglement of what seems to be discrete entities until the observer or researcher intervenes in a move towards knowledge production. This underscores not just the epistemology epistemological role of the researcher in knowledge production, but also their ethical responsibility. As Jenkins et al. point out, drawing from Barad, it matters what knowledge gets produced, not simply because knowledge has consequences, but because knowledge production is integral to worldly configurations. Consequently, our adoption of diffraction analysis will be attentive to the contradiction, tensions, challenges, collaborations, messiness, playfulness, precarity, and the decentering of knowledge that manifest in the practices and research of our interviewees as they contribute to the activist endeavor of intersectional feminist world building through their art, digital tools, scholarship, and archival work. Um, and diffraction, yeah, can be understood as um, part of an ethics of care because it acknowledges the ethical role of the researcher, recognizing lived experience as knowledge, um, challenges the notion of who is the expert, and it's research with and not on, for example, um, we include the researcher in the co-creation of the metadata, or so the interviewee, I should say. Um, okay, so that's the end of my talk. Thanks very much. And I'm going to pass over to Lawrence Hill, who's based in uh, Sussex University and is the creator of our, our research project. And he's going to talk about creation then as an act of care. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. <laughs> Hopefully, this will just scroll through. But um, um, Hello, everybody. I'm a freelance curator and a doctoral researcher, as Izzy said, at the University of Sussex. I've been a curator for a lot of years and a doctoral researcher for, like, one. So this is all new to me. My role in Full Start Feminism Project is a curatorial one, and this paper reflects on that role and its elisions with my ongoing practice-led doctoral research on curatorial activism. First, a short history of a milestone in my work because it positions me and my practice in respect of this project and my research. In 2017, as director of Brighton Digital Festival, I developed and curated a flagship conference. I'd never curated a conference before, and I decided on two things. Firstly, unlike every digital culture conference I'd ever been to, it wouldn't be dominated by cisgender straight white men. Secondly, I wanted to use Donna Haraway's Staying with the Trouble, which I'd just read, as a generative source for curation, challenging techno-solutionist narratives. From this starting point, the conference I titled The Messy Edge was conjured. 
I'd like to quote myself from the op so egotistical. I'd like to quote myself from the opening remarks I made at the first edition of that uh, of the conference in October 2017. The messy edge is the antithesis of the cutting edge. It's not clinical or shiny or binary. It's interested in technology and what it can do, but it doesn't celebrate technology for its own sake. It is human, sometimes confusing, often challenging and a bit awkward, but it is vital. To understand what follows, please understand that the messy edge is where I situate my practice and my research. The art world is inherently and historically undiverse. A 2019 study of the collections of museums and galleries across the USA showed that 85% of the artists represented were white and 87% were men. I recently read that the National Gallery in London has a collection that is 97% by male artists. I don't have stats for digital art in particular, but anecdata suggests it's a field even less diverse and the intersection of digital art and tech companies whose platforms and tools we are dependent on and are equally dominated by cis het white men no doubt reinforces that lack of diversity. Recent high profile exhibitions such as the Hayward Galleries in the Black Fantastic, whilst valuable and excellent in their own right, represent a history of highlighting a particular protected characteristic under the aegis of EDI, equality, diversity, inclusion thinking. Critically, this focus on one characteristic such as race serves to create silos which can be hard to escape for artists. It also allows organizations, in my experience, to indulge in a kind of tick box thinking by which they cross off their diversity show and return to regular programming for a few years. This is the state of affairs that has been in place for a long time. It is the orthodoxy, it is the state of the art. Given that changes can't be made overnight to institutional or capitalist modes of operation, how can we start to affect change in this environment? As we'll discuss, I'm interested in a different kind of diversity, a different kind of inclusion. The role of the curator has a long, much debated and somewhat contested history, but it is largely viewed as passive or instrumental, serving either the artist or the needs of the institution or both. The role of the curator is to take care of something. The word comes from the Latin curare, meaning to take care of. Historically, this might have been museum objects or art collections, but I propose redefining what that something is in order to change the framework within which, within which curatorial practice functions. I'm increasingly thinking of curation as an act of care, connecting to the broader project and feminist ethics of caring through curation. This is not care for objects, it is a different form of stewardship. I'm thinking about this curation and caring in two ways. One is tangible. It's about care and support for artists from groups who are less represented in the arts. And the second is caring for and securing something more abstract maybe, but critical, which is the need for digital art and the wider art world to be better, to represent more perspectives and be less siloed in its diversity, which would make it richer and more valuable to more people. My research and my contribution to this project centers the curation of work by POC, queer, disabled, and neuro neurodiverse digital artists. In centering groups whose identities are or have been historically pathologized and categorized as less than or non-human, this research work unsettles and undoes notions of the universal human, a figuration defined by Paul Preciado, as straight, white, middle-class men in their book, Can the Monster Speak? A figuration against whom all others are measured. I've coined the term the non-human assemblage to position this collective as agents of curatorial activism and a place within which to cite my own practice and relation to the universal human, the figuration and centering of which are the cause of many social injustices. My practice, my curation, my support, my care, is for this group of which I am a part. Far from its historically passive or instrumental role, I see a need for the role of the curator as agential, making something happen, making deliberate choices and carrying out deliberate actions. Through this process of agential thought and action, 
curation is framed as activism. And here we can entwine activism and curation as things that bring people together in a space or place of concentrated meaning. I'm drawing on the writing of curator Terry Smith. In centering the non-human assemblage in order to decenter, to unsettle the universal human, I'm thinking of curation as a generative act, creating fertile ground on which to create, or in fact curate, an unsettling. This is making change and this is rewriting future heritages. Catherine McKittrick's writing on Sylvia Winter has been foundational to my framing of curatorial practice, practice as activism. McKittrick theorizes undoing and unsettling Western conceptions of what it means to be human. She valorizes undoing and unsettling as opposed to replacing or occupying as a provocation. And I'm applying this provocation to the role of the non-human assemblage in my research and practice in making change to the structural orthodoxies of digital art and the wider art world. Returning to the intersection of digital art and tech, this activism can equally be applied to decentering the structural orthodoxies of cisgendered, white, ableist masculinity generated by the global co corporations on whose platforms and with whose tools digital artists are making and sharing their work. Overthrowing those global corporations that shape our digital world is unlikely, if not impossible, but unsettling them in their own spaces is not only possible, but crucial to remaking the future. Everything that I'm saying about the role of the non-human assemblage in making change in digital art practice is equally applicable to those online spaces. This curation of the non-human assemblage is generative. The artists selected for the Full Stack Feminism exhibition, you kind of scroll through them once there, are making work drawing on their identities, their intersectionalities, their lived experiences. Supporting these artists, working with them and curating their work to manifest the unsettling of the universal human is the focus of my practice. It is about bringing something new into being. I've been thinking a lot about manif manifestations recently. It's the name of the group exhibition I'm currently curating for this project. Manifestations are of the mind, uh, of the imagination, of the identity. They are definitionally the embodiment of abstract ideas. Manifestations are also corporeal as physical presences tied to activism. Manifestation is the French word for demonstration after all. These dual entwined definitions summon the unsettling, the undoing that I've envisaged and theorized in my research as the role of the non-human assemblage. I'm interested in how this plays out in the dynamics of a group show, the slightly out of favor Gesamtkunstwerk or total artwork. This is an exhibition of work and artists in dialogue going beyond the impacts of individual identities, though they are very much present, or individual works, I'm interested in the power of the work in its totality. This is the power of the non-human assemblage in all of its messy and intersectional joy. Its capacity to make change lies in its exponentially accumulated power. Future heritages are designed, written, and fabricated today. And these acts of agency, of activism, of undoing and unsettling will rewrite that future heritage. This work of redoing, remaking, and revisioning makes future heritages that will be revolutionarily different. It is urgent work, and it's taking place at the messy edge. Thank you. I don't have anyone to pass on to, but I will draw your attention to this slide, which uh, it's about the conference and the exhibition and the survey and other stuff. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, so I think we have, I don't think we have, I know we have about 14 minutes of uh, questions, if people have any. Um, there might be some questions from online. And apparently we have some boxes that we can throw around as a speaker. So, <laughs> so if you have any questions, please do let us know. Thank you. I, good. There's a microphone in here. Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to say this is absolutely inspiring. Absolutely. Every single one of you have touched on things that we need to be focused on, on more and more as we build these tools and as we develop uh, 
our technologies. So I just, first of all, want to really thank you for putting this together and for coming and doing this. My question actually is, I, I heard Dr. Fox reference an East African speaker and it struck me that this was one of the only voices I heard that came from outside Europe or North America. So my question is about the successes and the challenges of developing an intersectional feminism that is truly global and really does engage those voices in East Asia, South Asia, Africa, South America. Yeah. Thank you again. Yeah. I mean, I can, uh, thank you for your initial comment. That really means a lot and we really appreciate that. I mean, uh, maybe I'll let Izzy talk about maybe um, if that's specifically um, around the, the quote that you had. But in terms of the way we've approached the project, in many ways we're looking at our diasporic connections. So that's a way that we're kind of thinking about how we can be cohesive and how we can be diverse and how we can be connected in, in terms of the communities that we all engage in. And so there's a lot of like different connections that cross kind of national boundaries, that cross, cross boundaries into um, to North Africa. Um, and I think with the project itself, we're very aware of that need to be cohesive and comprehensive but we can't be all things to all things. So it's, it's one of those things that we acknowledge and I think in our follow-on funding, which has gone through, we don't know, um, it's all about impact and dissemination and that's one thing that we want to kind of tackle as well within that. Um, there is a kind of a sense that, you know, the, 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 the um, connections that we make, of course, are through where we are, but I think the need to kind of um, disperse beyond that is, is very prevalent and, and something that we duly note. I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. Hello. Um, so it is it is a UK Ireland project. So it is um, focused in that sense, and we do, as Sharon said, um, speak to our diasporic connections. Um, but by its nature, language is the main issue there, and you know we do we must recognise that code is very Western. Um, and English oriented. This conference today is in English, even though it's not an English speaking country, you know. So um, there are limitations in engagement there. Um, I think long term, a, a global approach would be interesting, but it needs to be one that connects with, uh, it needs to be a bottom up approach because I think what can often happen is, um, yeah, you, you know. We don't, we're not we're not preaching the gospel of digital humanities here, but if if other or bottom up organisations from different countries and different languages want to connect, then then we we would gain an awful lot of value from that connection, um, and it's important not to assume that they would too, you know, that that we'd be gaining from that collaboration. I hope that sort of answers your question. Mike is going over somewhere. People's tummies are rumbling. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the presentation. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to the development of the toolkit. And obviously, feminism is very much about kind of situated knowledge and situated practice. And so I was wondering if you could talk about that kind of tension between having to work in a particular context, but also trying to develop something that other people can draw on, at least my understanding of the toolkit is that it's something that other people can make use of. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about, about that toolkit. Yeah. yeah. I can. Um, so I mean, the, the idea of the toolkit is to kind of bring together voices that aren't just our voices. So we're very much kind of, as, as we kind of mentioned at the start, open to collaborations. And one way that we're kind of thinking about that, again, a bit kind of broader than our voices, is really using the PubHub platform to really think about kind of roles, designated roles, and how we can have like peer reviewers who are, you know, kind of connected to the network and then people who contribute in. And in terms of thinking about situated knowledge, I think we, you know, in other papers, we recognize that the stacks that we have 
you know, developed are very much based around the experiences that we have had, and there's other ways that maybe those could be constituents. So we're, we're interested in kind of how they may, might be developed and how might, they may be broadened. And I think particularly it's a very difficult thing, like we state this is a massive issue, you know, our interventions are only a drop in the ocean. And what we want to do in the toolkit as well is to draw attention to other projects that are out there, like we know, for example, Data Manifest No, we know there's Sister Server who's doing all the work around uh, autonomous feminist infrastructures, we know there's other uh, coding rights, for example, so we want to draw attention to work that's already existing. So it's again, it's about that comp being trying to be comprehensive while acknowledging the work that already exists. And I think that's a, a particular feminist ethics of care to others as well, to acknowledging the work. We don't come in just on our own, we are on the kind of like shoulders of, you know, other feminists, I suppose. Does that help? <laughs> Does anyone else add? And just in terms of toolkit, um, it's also about developing models that can be taken away from us. We, you know, from after that, they are there for people to use, to, to adapt, reuse, whatever they want to do with it. But hopefully that, that empowers them away from us. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to, trying to work, you know, <laughs> thinking in these infrastructures that are very hierarchical, very, uh, who, you know, claiming knowledge uh, and trying to think about a horizontal model and that not all archives have to be university located because we've got certain type of resources. Is how can um, independent uh, community-led archive can actually manage their own archives by themselves. I mean, I, I think in particular as well, there's something around autonomy as well. So one of the things that we're looking at is how you build autonomous feminist infrastructures. So we're doing experiments with Raspberry Pis and trying to build a kind of Raspberry clusters. And Cecile is, is leading on that work. So it's really interesting to think about how actually we're so entangled in these power systems, we're so entangled with technologies, and some of that work of experimentation is unpicking that. So, I mean, I think that's been an interesting experiment. Thank you. Thank you so much for your, all your presentations. It's very inspiring and very amazing project. I'm very excited to see how it further develops. I had two questions, one for uh, Lawrence Hill. So I'm very excited about this approach of uh, curatorial practices, especially kind of your approach to it. And I've had, I'm a musician, so I've had some experiences with curators and even though sometimes projects aim at making like their programs like more balanced like especially in terms of gender i feel that as an artist sometimes there like i can't even if i submit something there's like no response and the curatorial practices are not reflecting like what they're aiming at i had these experiences so i was just wondering could you tell us a little bit more of how you can feel also maybe artists that are feel excluded to feel more included and to feel more like comfortable to, uh, to, to put their work somewhere and do that step. And then my second question was for all of the presenters. So I was just wondering, so a lot of the work which I see nicely is like really goes into redefining the archive. And I myself work on archival data, and I was just wondering how you can help uh, the age scholars in making that translation from, I have an, ex I have an existing data set uh, that's based on an archival structure, and now I would like to kind of translate that into a more feminist framework. And I'm very interested in that um, because I feel like at the moment my work doesn't go beyond just reporting gender biases, but I would like to build on the existing archival structures, but then translate them into a framework uh, like uh, which is more you presented in this, um, or you present several frameworks uh, in this project. So thank you. Thank you. Um, hi. Thanks for the question. Um, I'm sorry you've had those experiences of not being responded to. That just is just shit. Sorry, I probably shouldn't say that word uh, in this context. But um, f from my perspective, 
what I try and do in my practice is to be, I mean, always responsive to people for a start. If you emailed me, I would respond to you. That's just a thing <laughs> that is like a human interaction. I don't understand why that's difficult. Um, but also to be mindful when we are kind of, when we write about opportunities for artists, for example, I mean, just very briefly, when we, we, we did an open call for two artists in residence for this project, and we were very careful about the language that we used and making sure that if we were talking about intersectional feminism that we had an explainer of what that meant because you know we didn't want anybody to feel excluded by the language uh, and then for me it's like giving time so you don't say well we've got this artist call it closes in two weeks it's like you know it's six weeks you know is a minimum for me because it recognizes that people take time to process things and people have other jobs and they can't necessarily just drop everything you know to respond to an open call so it's all of those kind of things it's i, ca I can't speak for anyone's practice other than mine um but those are the things that i'm kind of mindful of and you know if people aren't responding to you, you just probably don't want to work with them anyway because they suck. <laughs> so um, that, that's sort of how I, I hope that answers your question to an extent. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll tackle your second question. And I think what you asked was that you, you, you are creating an archive and you're recording gender biases, but how do you go further? Uh, and I think it's worth taking a look at your platforms. Um, and th there's actually quite a lot of options out there that, of open source, uh, community um, developed uh, solutions out there for you. It, and just accept that it will take you longer, but that's okay, you know, and th that you're, you actually doing the work is contributing to the process that you want to achieve. Um, so, so slow down and, and start, think of the full stack from, from the back end right to the front end, which is slow and complicated and fiddly, but worth it. Yeah. I, I think it's also worth kind of considering as well how you're building archives, who you include in the conversation, who is writing metadata, who you bring into that conversation. So work that we've done around the toolkit in terms of inclusive metadata is really thinking about, well, who does the collection belong to? Who is writing the metadata and giving agency to people who are represented in those? That means that the metadata is, is written in an inclusive way and it's representative of individual identities, but also creates a community around these spaces. So what's an archive if it doesn't actually serve a purpose? And I just wanted to add very quickly to what Lawrence was saying. I think, Lawrence, you're doing yourself a slight disservice. You did a lot of work around making sure that everyone, there were over 75 people who applied. You did a lot of work around making sure that each individual got like extensive feedback and you even offered to meet people afterwards who weren't successful. So I think, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> acknowledge that work as well. It's, it's yeah. Well, maybe one last question, and then then, I, then we're standing between you and lunch, I think. So. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful presentation. I just wanted to know a little bit about the two ends uh, of this, um, you know, full stack. Meaning, who are these archives? If you could say just a little bit more about who are um, the archives you're working with, and in terms of then the engagement post-project, which is always a very complicated thing because we produce lots of things, we produce the toolkits, we get old stuff you know, online and then very few people know about it or very little people engage. So I just wanted to know about the strategies, who are the archives you worked with yeah. and the actual strategies in terms of disseminating, yeah. pushing. Yeah. Do you want to talk, you talk about the archives? Okay. Um, so in terms of kind of the various archives that we've engaged with, we have like a network of individuals and kind of different community archives like Queer Heritage South, Queer in Brighton, the Brighton Hope Black History Group, Harringay Vanguard, which is a LGBT um, archive, Cork LGBT archive, there's the Irish Travellers archive, and there's various other organisations that we've engaged with closely. And one of the things that I highlighted in the, the talk that I was kind of bringing together was that we've held community forums. 
Um, and those are a way to kind of bring people into the conversation. And we're looking to maybe create resources within the toolkit for community archives to engage in. In particular, you know, in particular what we're trying to do is work with the Digital Repository of Ireland to do some sort of kind of like a uh, resource um, for community archives, thinking about the ways in which they might be able to create their own archives and kind of maintain that. Um, and I think the biggest thing is about continually having that conversation. Um, I know particularly in the work that I do outside of Full Stack Feminism, you know, I've worked with Career Heritage Said to build their Omeka archive and it's a constant conversation. So their ephemera are, is, in my, is in my office and we use it with students, myself and James Baker who are sitting at the front, we started kind of managing that collection through student engagement in a way that has been kind of, it's co-creating the archive. So there's a sense that, you know, we don't just kind of come in and go, oh, let's create this. We're really kind of tending to it in a very kind of, I suppose, an ethics of care way. Um, so yeah, so it's thinking about that full cycle. And the second question. I'm going to try to answer it. Uh, so we've got a follow-up uh, research pitch, which is about impact. Um, um, and part of it is uh, going to uh, the communities and offering the models to get the, that we, we will have finished hopefully by, by then. And, um, and also being responsive to the communities themselves that we be working with if we obviously get funded. <laughs> um, and, and the other bit is about policy. So we're also working towards developing the policies to, uh, around ethical care, uh, ethics of care. Um, so even if, you know, that, that's the broader picture really that's beyond the communities, but definitely will affect the community too, hopefully for the better. And, and, and I suppose just choice of platform as well. So we've chosen PubHub very strategically because it will exist beyond the lifespan of this project. And it means that, you know, having the kind of way in which we gain external contributors, we're hoping that we can then create a steering committee or something to kind of like steer that. So it's not just us that are kind of like managing after the project ends. So it becomes a living document, becomes something that people can contribute to. And I suppose within DH, it's really important to think about kind of like platforms after the project ends because digital preservation, which is my other hat, so don't get me started on that. <laughs> so I think... I think we'll, we'll end on that, on that note. Um, thank you all for attending. This has been absolutely fantastic. And Cecile? Yeah. Just, if you've got more questions, just come and find us. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yes. So thank you.